Hey there, everyone, and welcome to Twin Movies. I'm Ben Phelps, and I'm joined by my regular buddy and banter. Gabe Dowrick. Hello. Every year, Gabe, Hollywood releases two movies based on the same idea. So, as usual, we ask the big question, which movie did it better? Today, we'll be reviewing two classic twin movies about the life of Apple founder Steve Jobs. It's Jobs versus Steve Jobs. Let the games of jobbing begin. So let's kick off this episode with an overview of these twin movies and a flashback to our first encounter with them. On the 16th of August 2013, Jobs was released with Ashton Kutcher. Here's its IMDb synopsis. The story of Steve Jobs' ascension from college dropout into one of the most revered creative entrepreneurs of the 20th century. So Gabe, did you originally catch Jobs when it was released at the cinema? And what was that experience like? Was this film released at the cinema? I don't know if it was, which probably speaks to our enthusiasm for it. It was in the US, I think, right. but I don't know if it got a release in Australia at the cinema. Well, I did not. I, In fact, I saw this movie, I'm casting my mind back to yesterday when I saw it. But I don't think that really speaks to my unenthusiasm for the film, because as we'll get to in the reviews, I like this movie, but... um. Yeah, I watched it at home yesterday. There is no great anecdote about this one, I'm afraid. What about you? Did you see it at the Art House Cinema in Canberra in 1998? <laughs> there is a trend, isn't there? <laughs> no, I did not. And maybe if it was available at my Art House Cinema in 1998, I could have. But no, I didn't. I saw it on video on demand, especially for this podcast. It's one of those films that I've always wanted to see as a curiosity because, to me, this is one of those classic examples of this podcast, which is Hollywood releasing two films based on the same idea at the same time. And this one felt like, I guess, the fastest cash grab. So I caught it eventually. But wait, what do you mean cash grab? Didn't the Ashton Kutcher one come first? Yeah, but it happened almost immediately after he died. Oh, it's a cash grab on Steve Jobs, not a cash grab on a movie about Steve Jobs being made by a bigger production company. I gotcha. Yeah. So, look, I caught it on VOD. Like you, not much to say about the experience in terms of being at home on a big screen opposed to being at the cinema. So uh, You might have been sitting in a comfy chair. It was a You're very comfortable beanbag and I had my legs oh, nice. up elevated. So, I did feel very relaxed. So, based on that... Pretty uh, prosaic experience. We can jump to the next one, shall we? Okay. What is the next one? Because this is the pair of twin movies where if you said to me which movie was Steve Jobs and which was Jobs, I would have no idea. Not because of the content, just the dang titles. Yeah, I read my notes about five times because I keep being confused. Interestingly enough, and we'll get to some of these details later on, but Jobs was originally called iJobs. Get it? Okay. Which one's Jobs? <laughs> Is that the Kucha one? Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense that it would have a really, really more, much more terrible title, iJobs. I can totally see on paper in the pitch where they thought, what are we going to call this? I can totally understand how you get to the title iJobs. Like, of course, it makes sense, right? Like, it's a bit they of had a- had a brain injury. What? <laughs> but I do recall when I saw the first teaser poster, which I think actually had iJobs on it with the lowercase i and then capital J-O-B-S. And when I saw it on the poster, I thought, yeah, nah. It resembles those rip-off products where you buy third-party Apple accessories like speakers for your iPod or something. And it's called the iCool or I Sound Weird Waves or I Something. We even had a phase right. there where there was the Hyundai minibus, like a truck, and that's called the iLoad. Like there was this window of time just past the first iPod release where lowercase i was added to everything to try and write the coattails of the iconic naming convention of the iPod. And of course, all those products, none of those products were as good as the iPod. And as a result, I think that's probably one of the reasons why Apple themselves started moving away from the i something because the naming convention had been hijacked by less than sterling products. Yeah, they're the sort of things that um, people post up photos around Christmas time like, ah, my nana fucked up <laughs> because she got me a 
Yeah, whatever you call it, some shitty third part. I blow, I schmuck, I crap. I saw in Kmart just recently, last weekend, the iWatch. And I thought, huh, that's funny, isn't it? Because I think Apple themselves couldn't get the rights to ITV because of the pre-established UK TV channel. So, that had to name their puck for your TV, the Apple TV. And then when it came to the watch, someone else had also licensed iWatch. So, they went for Apple Watch. And ever since then, they've kind of gone for just basically the phrase Apple and then like the generic name of the description of the object itself as a way to get around everyone trying to jump on board the i-something bandwagon. So, it's sort of funny that if you do see an iWatch in the shops, it's quite a reasonable assumption of Nana to make that's the real McCoy. <laughs> yeah, totally. Well, I guess the only computer product that they still sell is the iMac because all of the rest are called like MacBook Pros or MacBook Airs. They're not called like iMacBook Pros, MacBook i Airs. So they've seemed to have just sort of retired the i. What do you call that? What's a letter that goes in front of a word? There's a term for it, some sort of English term. An ambitious letter? <laughs> Onomatopoeia. No, I don't know. Fuck it. Whatever it is. I fuck it. Who cares? There's still the iPhone, of course, but that is so entrenched oh, yes, in our course. culture that I can't see that going anywhere unless they do a huge reset on that product line. Anywho, let's jump to the 3rd of October 2015 when Steve Jobs was released, the movie. Here's its IMDb synopsis. Steve Jobs takes us behind the scenes of the digital revolution to paint a portrait of the man at the epicenter. The story unfolds backstage at three iconic product launches, ending in 1998 with the unveiling of the iMac. So, Gabe, please walk me through when and how you first watched this film called Steve Jobs. I first watched this film called I, Steve Jobs. I must have watched it on DVD or Blu-ray or something because I definitely skipped it at the movies because, I don't know. I guess I just didn't really give a fuck about a biography of Steve Jobs. I think I'd read a book about him previously or something. I was like, well, I guess I'm all Steve Jobs out and wasn't particularly in the mood for it, despite it being directed by one of my favourite directors, Danny Boyle, Esquire. So, yeah, to be honest, I can't really remember the first time I watched it, although I liked it and I probably thought to myself, oh, this would have been interesting to have seen on the big screen. Dang it. Yeah. What about you? I caught this one on the big screen. Like you, I love Danny Boyle. I just think he's an incredible director who's able to apply his talents to a wide variety of genres. He rarely gets complacent. He's always pushing himself. Some of his best films are the ones you'd least expect him to make. And when I heard it was him taking on the work of Aaron Sorkin, who's known for his fast-paced dialogue, and his TV shows, particularly like The West Wing, Newsroom, Sports Night, what else? That's most of them, isn't it? I think it is. And, of course, he's done films like The Social Network. Social Network, yeah. So, I had heard the reviews well in advance. And I was curious because we'd already had the Ashton Kutcher film, which I think went to either Sundance or South by Southwest film festivals or had had some sort of attention beforehand just by the really? sheer fact. Yeah, just because- it was a bio based on Steve Jobs, and in the still photographs, the images of Ashton Kutcher, it very much looked like Steve Jobs. And even though people have been critical of Ashton Kutcher, people had also commented that he is someone who's actually made a substantial proportion of his wealth, actually from his investments in Silicon Valley startups. So he actually did have a sincere interest in the life and the business acumen of Steve Jobs. So there was a sincere interest by him in actually making that film and it wasn't just a single cash grab. It may have been by the people involved in the film like producers, but speaking for him as he described it, he was very much inspired by Steve Jobs the person and his technological advancements. And when I then heard that this film was coming out, I thought, hmm, this is interesting. You're casting a guy who looks radically different in the lead role, who's got hair that's closer to Ginger in colour than Steve Jobs' black hair and also looks just dramatically different in body shape and face and so on. Then you've got Aaron Sorkin, who had proved himself with The Social Network, which everyone had written off as being the Facebook movie, like the Monopoly movie or like the Battleship the movie. The Monopoly movie. Well, at the time, 
They didn't make that in the end. No, but when they first <laughs> Monopoly movie. when they first announced the social network, everyone, including me, had misinterpreted the film to be a film taking advantage of a property like Battleship when it had to be made clearer in press leading up to the release of the social network that what David Fincher and Aaron Sorkin were actually doing was, in their words, a Shakespearean tragedy and just happened to be set in the world where Facebook actually started, but it wasn't a film that was trying to, in a cheap way, cash in on the brand of Facebook. So when this film was announced, I thought, okay, these guys, well, Aaron Sorkin anyway, has proven himself in not just doing a cash grab based on the brand of the famous person behind the film. So let's see what he does. And all the reviews had said this film was set in three locations over one and a half to two hours. So essentially, it was very play-like and it was a lot of talking, but without the obvious cinematic flourishes of David Fincher in The Social Network, and it could have been almost a play. And I thought, hmm, do I want to see a play on the big screen? Because that's the sort of thing I can't stand. I'm a cinephile. Plays often, unfortunately, this sounds very uncouth, but often bore me because I want the close-ups on the actors' faces. I want to see the light reflecting on their eyes. I want to sort of watch the twitches around their mouth as they talk and express their emotions. And I thought, do I want to see a filmed play? But I also knew it was Danny Boyle who had made a film like 127 Hours, which is set in one location, and that was incredibly cinematic. And he elevated what would have sounded like a pretty boring pitch to be a really engaging and surprisingly fast-paced movie. So for that reason, I went along to the cinema out of curiosity, out of loyalty to Danny Boyle, Aaron Sorkin, and to see what they could possibly do to have a different take on this character. And I enjoyed it. Nice. Would you describe it as a Shakespearean tragedy also? No. I mean, what's the definition of that? That I don't know. People- they kill themselves at the end. Yeah. I mean, isn't just saying it's a Shakespearean tragedy just saying it's a tragedy? Well, would you even describe The Social Network as a Shakespearean tragedy? No. Or would you describe it as that while making a jerk-off motion with your hand? Isn't the phrasing Shakespearean tragedy the same sort of use as they'd say elevated genre? So rather than just saying oh, awful. it's a tragedy- so it's a type of it's a subgenre of the drama genre. You gotta go, no, no, no. It's Shakespearean. And that way it makes it seem that it's not gonna be if it's gonna be sad, it's gonna be worth your time and bring a lot of kudos with it. <laughs> totally. Look, this is a slight divergent, but I don't even think we should be breaking genres down into subgenres. There's just like four of them drama, comedy, horror, and another one that I'm not sure about. That's all. We don't need none of this tragedy or just it's a drama or it was a comedy or maybe it was a comedy drama, but that will do. A dramedy. Thank you very much. A dramedy, sure. Then we've just talked a little bit about our first experiences with these films. And, you know, to be fair, cinematic or VOD experience wasn't remarkable in shaping our impression of our review. So let's just jump into how we got here with a shallow dive into the Hollywood history behind these two flicks. So, do you know anything about how these films came about, Gabe, before I give you a few tidbits? I mean, my guess would have been that Steve Jobs was born, Steve Jobs did some things, and then he died. And then some producers went, ah, he was an important bloke. Let's make a movie about that. Am I on the right track? Pretty much. Okay, sweet. In Jobs, the Ashton Kutcher film, screenwriter Matt Whiteley actually began work on the screenplay around the time that Steve Jobs took medical leave from Apple to battle his pancreatic cancer. So they'd already started assembling their research with interviews and materials before he died. So they were on the front foot. Right. And then they started filming this film actually in 2012. Quite interestingly, they actually managed to film it at his childhood home with the help of- Oh, really? Yeah. So I'd assumed this film was the renegade film. It was definitely the indie film, but I thought this film was, at the time, the unendorsed film. That's why I kind of called it half truthfully, half jokingly as the cash grab. But it actually seemed to have the support of everyone. Like when they filmed it, they had the help of Jobs' stepmother, Marilyn Jobs, who still lives in the house. And the shoot at the house was observed by his sister, Patricia. So there was a lot of support. So it would appear that basically this film had been given the rubber stamp in some capacity, you know, the tick of approval. Now, 
that was all happening in 2012 because Jobs died around 2011. Now, Steve Jobs, the other film, the one directed by Danny Boyle and Aaron Sorkin, that was released significantly later. And basically what happened is Sony Pictures acquired the rights to the biography by Walter Isaacson in October 2011. So do you recall back then, we're about eight and a half years ago from the time we were recording this podcast, in October 2011, that's when pretty much the time the book came out by Walter Isaacson. And that was the book that sort of was almost like a deathbed confession in some respects by Jobs. He basically was very collaborative. He shared hints and clues about what had gone wrong in the past, what he was planning for the future. So there were all these rumours about how the Apple TV device would evolve and what the future plans of Apple would be in relation to video streaming that were kind of teased out in that book. But by actually basing the screenplay on that book, they pretty much had the authoritative source of information. So what's interesting to me is that the first film didn't have that and... That's interesting because this film, this particular book, seemed to kind of crack the nut and explain a lot which hadn't been explained before. Yeah, I remember reading that book, although I have no recollection, to be honest, of it. But I think that was definitely one of those books that seemed kind of ubiquitous at the time. Every dork was reading it. Yeah, it was pretty popular. And I do recall, like, tidbits being released, you know, over weeks and weeks on The Verge and various tech websites, but also, you know, appearing in the Sydney Morning Herald and sort of local papers because he was considered a bit of an icon and so many people had an iPhone in his hand and sort of could appreciate that he was one of the inspirations behind that. I think in terms of the history of the making of the film, guess who was in the director's chair before Danny Boyle took over? I don't know. At one point, Christian Bale was going to do the film. Was it that time when he was attached? Close. He was in the running at some stage. So in terms of the acting roles, DiCaprio was discussed for the lead role then Bale came on board, then Damon, Ben Affleck, Bradley Cooper were all being considered. Sorkin actually revealed in an interview that Bale was then cast again, but in the end it obviously went Danny Boyle, but as a director, and then he cast Michael Fassbender is how it sort of reads. But it was Fincher who was actually originally in the role to direct. Oh, really? So he's like second tech-based collab with Aaron Sorkin. Hmm. Yeah, and apparently just left because of a contract dispute. But on paper, that makes sense, doesn't it? They make. Oh, well, yeah. He probably wanted a $300 million budget for it. Yeah, probably. He probably did. And yeah. this. They need the $100 million per scene. It's like, I think he spent, you know, a healthy chunk of cash on Panic Room, which was set in one location. And he probably thought, right, this is three locations. So I want three times as much money. That's right. Get me three Jodie Fosters. So, Gabe. Let's start then with our review of the first of these films, Jobs with Ashton Kutcher. Did you like it? What worked for you about this film? And what didn't float your boat? It's interesting, I guess, what we were talking about before, that it felt like it appeared that this movie was a cash grab or it looked like it was some sort of cheapy TV movie starring an actor that doesn't exactly come with a, a critical gravitas or something. But um, I kind of enjoyed it. I thought it was, it was pretty pleasant. It was a pleasant two hours and eight minutes. You know, it sort of does that classic bio thing where it just whips through the years and just checks in with all of the characters and, and hits all of the greatest moments of Steve Jobs' uh, life or, and all the low points too in, a, in just a nice way where a whole bunch of like actors you may or may not recognise from TV shows turn up in small roles and you can, you can just soak it in and then... 24 hours later, you probably can't remember much about it except to know that you had a pretty good time. That's my review. (laughs) I liked it. That's just an incredible review with the word pleasant. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. Ordinarily, you don't really hear a review that's positive that uses the word pleasant. It tends to be used more in describing something that is politely pleasing but actually not very good. I suspect, and correct me if I'm wrong, that you basically had such low expectations that the only way was up. Yeah, I mean, yes, but, like, that's nice. I like it when, uh, like, I watch a lot of crap, and I like it when I'm pleasantly surprised by that crap, and this was definitely better than that because I wouldn't describe this movie as crap. It was a nice time, man, a nice t- Did you not have a nice time with this movie, is that what you're saying? Did you not have a nice time? 
I really enjoyed this film in spite of myself. It's weird. I was so primed to hate this film because it was pretty – I thought at the time it was buried, but when we get to the box office figures, you know, it's quite surprising. But I just didn't have a positive impression of this film from the very first moment it was announced. So I follow online film gossip websites daily. And I recall when they announced this film was going to happen. And it was who was involved in the film, which on the face of it didn't impress me. So I hadn't heard of the director, Joshua Michael Stern. And when I looked him up on IMDb, nothing leaped out to me to think, oh, this is the guy that's going to create the definitive Steve Jobs movie. That isn't a criticism of the director, Joshua Michael Stern. I was just judging it at a very shallow level by what I could read on IMDb. So, totally admitting my lack of awareness or prejudice or lack of understanding as to his filmography. Hadn't heard of the writer either. Ashton Kutcher, never been a huge fan of his. And so, I just thought, oh, is he the sort of person to infuse this iconic character and capture the cadence, the very specific way that Steve Jobs spoke? I even saw like Josh Gad attached to play Steve Wozniak, Steve Jobs' co-creator, co-founder of Apple. And at the time I thought, oh, isn't he just a poor man's version of Seth Rogen? Which is kind of uh, ironic because three years later, Seth Rogen plays the same character in Danny Boyle's film, Steve Jobs. So I guess you'd say I was prepared to not like this film and I quite enjoyed it. Like, I guess my qualifier of quiet is a bit like your use of pleasant. Like, it was a very entertaining film. It was much more cinematic than I expected. Like, absolute credit where credit is due to the director, Anastra Kusher, and the writer, Matt Whiteley. I actually found it a pretty cinematic film. Like, it had some great use of music. Huge credit to them for getting the rights to so many iconic songs that are used to define the era, like 70s, 80s, 90s, it's edited together, I think, quite effectively. I think it moves at a good clip, and but then chooses to focus on a specific part of his career. So in Jobs, they focus on the window when Steve Jobs is post high school through to, when does it end? I think it ends sort of when he returns to Apple and they're about to release the iMac. Is that right? Yeah, because Modine plays John Scully, who, what's his name? Fatty McFat, uh, Jeff Daniels plays um, in Steve Jobs. And yeah, so Kutcher comes back, John Scully goes back out. He's felt betrayed by Scully and it ends around there, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, I keep confusing movies. Uh, I've just re- Am I? <laughs> I've just realised in my head, I'm confusing the movie. One of the movies has Steve Jobs talking to the graphic designer about the coloured translucent shell. That's Jobs. Jobs, for the iMac. He goes and meets, uh, he's a real famous guy whose name I've completely forgotten. We are both blanking on this guy's name and he's one of the most iconic designers for Apple. You keep talking and I'll find it right now because we both know who he is and we've just blanked momentarily on his name, but continue. John Ive? Johnny Ive. Yeah, Johnny Ive, that's it. Yeah, so they included him. I mean, it really felt like Jobs was trying to include everyone who might have had something to do with the rise and the rise and the fall and the rise of Mr. Jobs. Yeah, that's right. And perhaps what we should do, which we haven't done before, but in this film, which is based on true characters, perhaps to make it a bit easier for our viewers who have seen both films, or if they haven't seen both films, they can kind of follow along. Because I know there'll be people who actually saw Steve Jobs, loved it, didn't see Jobs with Ashton Kutcher, but we'd be curious to know how the different characters were represented. To give you a bit of a comparison, in Jobs, we had Josh Gad, the American comedy drama actor, playing Steve Jobs' co-founder, Steve Wozniak. The same role is played by Seth Rogen in Steve Jobs. What are other one-for-ones? You mentioned Matthew Modine in Jobs played John Scully, and... That was played by Jeff Daniels in Danny Boyle's film. Yeah. Who else? I mean, Kate Winslet plays a character called Joanna Hoffman, who I don't think is a 
character in Jobs, or if she is, she's a very minor character. And then Michael Stuhlberg plays a character called Andy Hertzfeld, who, again, I don't think, or if they are, are a very minor character in Jobs. So, there's actually not a huge amount of overlap, and it may well be because of that structure. Steve Jobs taking place in just sort of, sort of three product launches, whereas Jobs, you know, wanting to be like, hey, and then, you know, where would Apple have been without the help of crazy, crazy Rod Holt, played by Ron Eldard. Yeah. <laughs> I will, we'll get to him. You knew I was going to bring up Eldard. Love Eldard. Uh, by the way, <laughs> there was an actor called Eldon Henson who played oh, yeah, okay. Andy Hertzfield in Jobs. Oh, okay. But it must be a tiny role because he's not part of the main narrative at all. Yeah, he was one of the Bash brothers in Mighty Ducks, and I don't actually even remember him being in the movie. And I'm usually pretty good at picking Bash brothers. Uh, so There was also yeah. Abigail McConnell, who is uncredited, playing Joanna Hoffman, who Kate Windsor played in Steve Jobs. But the interesting thing is that neither of these characters featured much at all in the Ashton Kutcher version. And that also really reflects the time that these films are set. As mentioned earlier, Ashton Kutcher, that film was set in the first half, I would say, of the career of Steve Jobs. And I think the journey of Jobs is to convey the origins of this iconic business person, marketer, creator, to the iMac when basically things just took a massive upswing at that point. Whereas in Steve Jobs, Danny Boyle's film featuring Michael Fassbender, not the Ashton Kutcher one, that one is based in much more recent events, based about around the time when the iMac has been released and it seems to be sort of later in his career when he already has the respect and also disregard people around him, but is much more entrenched as a multimillionaire already. Yeah, I think that's very fair to say. What were the highlights for you of Jobs? Like, what do you think is either different or better than the Danny Boyle version? I have to say I'm a sucker for, I guess it's a sort of DTV thing where you've sort of stacked your cast with, I don't know, what's a real nice way to say it? Very good but affordable actors. So I love watching this movie where it's like, oh, look, check it out. J.K. Simmons is rolling in for a scene or two. And then, oh, John Getz has turned up for a scene or two. Oh, it's Kevin Dunn. Oh, check it out. Wow. James Woods plays a college professor in one scene. I'm sure he's coming back for another. Nope, he's not. He's one and done. There he goes. Dermot Mulroney. Yes, one of the best Dermots. So I enjoy it for that reason. I agree with you. It's one of those classic cases. I share that same joy of yours where you're spotting all of those recognisable actors who you haven't seen in a long time. And they come in just one or two scenes. I'm actually surprised by the calibre of some of the actors in Jobs because I didn't think the film actually had that sort of budget. Like, you do get some interesting people playing characters like Lucas Haas, Matthew Medine. Yeah, he's very good. I mean, J.K. Yeah, Simmons, I think, had won or been nominated for an Oscar at this stage in his career, if I'm not wrong in thinking that. So I just thought he'd be the sort of person who'd be beyond the scope of this production. James Woods, like, what's he doing in this film? Like, it's quite interesting who pops up. And I can't help but think because the director and writer didn't have many credits, so therefore it'd be harder to try and lure cast onto a smallish production, the actual brand of Steve Jobs must have carried a lot of weight. I mean, you could have actors pull iPhones out of their pocket and think, wow, I could star in the biography about the guy who created this mini computer in my pocket. That's incredible. So that must have helped, I think, draw together this pretty diverse cast with some reasonably recognisable players. Yeah, definitely. I mean, what else? You said before you liked the music. I thought it was a fairly nicely shot movie. I have to say, I did like as well that earlier we said, oh, would this film just be sort of a cash-in or something? And maybe you expect it to be sort of a hagiography. But, you know, it does also try to paint Steve Jobs as an arsehole. The guy was definitely an arsehole. And it doesn't shy away from making you go, geez, he was a Real prick, this guy. Yeah, you're right. That's a really good point. I'm glad you raised it. It would have been really easy as the first film out of the gate to represent Steve Jobs on screen in a fictional context, to define him as a bit of a deity, as someone who was perfect, when all biographies about him and all articles about him and all anecdotes from people who've worked closely with him for 30 years do say that he was an asshole a lot of the time. Now, some people say you've got to be a prick 
to get ahead in business, to try and push people to breaking point, to try and get new ideas up, to try and move things forward. I always think that sometimes a bit of an excuse. Obviously, determination isn't the same thing as being a prick, but he is defined negatively in many circumstances and essentially defined often as being either bullheaded or incredibly unempathetic to other people. I think he's defined more negatively, to be honest, in Steve Jobs. Oh, definitely. Well, they do the whole thing with his daughter, where he's just a, like monstrously cruel to a tiny child. Exactly, exactly. Actually, I want to really talk about that. So, what we'll do is let's put a bow then on our review of Jobs. But before we do, I just want to give a shout out to Ashton Kutcher, which is an expression I thought I'd be using anytime soon. But I must say, I actually thought he did a very good job in the role in terms of capturing the look and sound of Steve Jobs. And I thought he was very effective on screen to play this charismatic, complicated character who had incredible insights and elements of brilliance, but also an incredible lack of empathy for those that he worked closely with for so long. I thought he did a good job. Yeah, totally. I mean, there was a few points where I thought maybe just ever so slightly he was overmannered in that maybe he'd like over-corrected or something to be like, hey, look, I'm really playing the guy. Like, he did the sort of Steve Jobs Steve Jobs hands too much or something. But broadly, yeah, I think you're totally right. He's sort of surprisingly good in this. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Credit where credit's due. Poor Ashton Kutcher. Any review where he's good in anything, people will be like, wow, what a surprise. I thought this guy was a dummy. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. I mean, he mainly captures the unique accent of Steve Jobs. Yeah. And it's a pretty difficult accent to capture, so I was pretty impressed by his consistency. It didn't seem to waver. I agree with you that a few times he seemed slightly more mannered than he had to be, and that's perhaps the sign of an actor who doesn't quite nail it in the, as organically as you'd expect. But I thought, I imagine he, I'd put him in the top two representations of Steve Jobs on screen so far. Oh, definitely. I mean, he's definitely in the top two that we're reviewing today. So, you got to hand it to the guy. Exactly. All right. Let's jump to the other film with the other actor playing the same guy, Steve Jobs. Let's jump to Danny Boyle's film with Michael Fassbender. So, you mentioned before about the characterization of Steve Jobs through his relationship with his daughter. And this film does a absolutely searing representation of his empathy and denial in being the parent of Lisa, that is just so hard to reconcile in your brain. Like, there's a scene where he meets his uh, his daughter comes in to meet him, and it's at the launch of his computer named Lisa. And there's actually a review where they they spoke to the real one of the real colleagues of Steve Jobs. I think it was Andy Hertzfield or someone like that, and they said, "Is this film a true depiction of Steve Jobs's life?" Because a lot happens in three locations, and the answer he gave was, nothing you see on screen ever happened, but everything is true. Words that ah, effect. Nice. And that basically, I think, is a great compliment to Aaron Sorkin, where basically what you're saying is, nothing happened like this, but essentially the essence of what you see on screen happened. So, if he had a fight or denied being the biological father of his daughter, Lisa, it wouldn't have happened at the high stakes launch of a computer, but it happened over many years behind the scenes in houses, in office rooms, with divorce attorneys, etc. So the point is what you see on screen is in the essence of what actually happened. And the idea that he has a computer called Lisa and he cannot reconcile the fact that this daughter is called Lisa, who he denies he is a parent of, and denies to her on screen that she was the inspiration behind the naming convention of the computer, that to me was a gut-wrenching moment and a part that just so perfectly and succinctly captured the oddness of this man. Mm. And then he only comes around to finally giving her and her mother money when she engages with the computer in a way that he finds interesting. Like, I guess he's not like a sociopath, but fuck, the film really paints him as just someone completely blinkered to the emotions and sort of feelings of other people. And I agree. Like, it makes for a very interesting watch because this is certainly not a hagiography 
And it really balances the idea of like, oh, yeah, he, I mean, he didn't even invent these things. As, as Seth Rogen's character points out, like, what does he even do except to be a prick to people and sort of make them be their best? But, you know, boy, what a prick. Yeah, the use of Seth Rogen's character, Steve Wozniak, to call to attention one of the greatest criticisms of Steve Jobs in that he was a marketer or business person first and inventor second is really good because he calls that out and says, what do you even do? But also, there's this ongoing part that was so relentless, it actually started annoying me potentially as much as Steve Jobs on screen, where Wozniak's asking Steve Jobs over and over to thank the Apple II team. And that's a reference to the fact that Steve Jobs left the company. They pushed ahead with a computer called the Apple II, spelt with Roman numerals with two eyes. And that film wasn't as inventive. It didn't break radically new ground, but it was affordable and was pretty much the bread and butter livelihood of Apple. So Jobs didn't like it because he didn't think it was cutting edge enough, but the suits liked it because it actually kept the company afloat. And when Steve Jobs returned to Apple, he wanted to dump the Apple II computer with his newly designed computer, which cost twice as much. You couldn't actually open up the box and tinker with stuff and change the RAM. It was a very much a closed ecosystem, which became a defining trait of the Apple brand. And all Wozniak wants him to do is just acknowledge the people who worked on this other computer that kept the lights on. And he literally just wants a verbal thanks on stage. And Steve Jobs refused to do that. That, again, was another searing characterization of him and just highlighted his flaws in that he couldn't share credit with anyone, even though it was just the logical thing to do. Not even the nice thing to do. But the logical thing to do to have a cohesive, smoothly running organization. Yeah, what does he say? Uh, musicians play their instruments. I play the orchestra. Such a prick. Such a prick. Yeah, that's right. You're right, though. Like Rogan's character, Steve Wozniak, sort of does exist in this to be a sort of moral voice. I mean, he also says to Jobs' character at one point something to the effect of you can be a decent guy and gifted at the same time. It's not. What does he say? It's not binary or something. Such good dialogue because the word binary is used with almost a pun in this world of tech. It is a computer word. Yep. It's a computer word. (laughs) Classic computer word. I don't know what it meant. Zeros and ones or something to that effect. And yeah, it's interesting. And it's also actually funny that there's a sort of parallel. You said like Fincher was attached before. And there's certainly that thing in filmmaking where there's a lot of directors who get a pass because they're huge pricks but make good movies. And it was interesting watching this and sort of thinking about that because, you know, I'm not that particularly interested in computers. I use them, but I don't really care about the history of them so much, but I love films and stuff. And it was interesting thinking about the sort of morality of Steve Jobs and his life and thinking about that in in regards to, you know, directors that I really like who've made fantastic films but have reputations for being giant assholes too. And you think, ah, you know, would they have made those movies and would those movies have been as good, but did they need to be as bigger dickheads doing it? So I really enjoyed that aspect of this in terms of it feeling like it spoke to other areas of things that I'm interested in or, or personality broadly. I'm so glad you mentioned that because I hadn't thought of that at all, but it's a really insightful comment about the parallel with film directors. You and I have talked, sometimes argued, about this idea that you can be a nice guy and be incredibly talented, and the words of Steve Wozniak, it's not binary. Yet, because some of the directors that you and I love, like David Fincher, have reputations for being unreasonable or assholes, ostensibly, as we read articles and hear behind the scenes, and you think, could you have made Alien 3 with all the troubles that went on unless you were someone like David Fincher, like he has got an awful reputation, but his films are fantastic. So what is the collateral damage of the arrogance of personality to get those films up? Danny Boyle, as I've noticed in all reviews and like interviews and so on, comes across as an incredibly affable, nice guy. Just the way, incredibly reasonable too, like he just seems very reasonable He doesn't seem led by ego. Cast and crew speak very highly of him. And his films, some of them are like pretty challenging and dynamic. Like, who would have thought the pitch for Slumdog Millionaire 
would eventually end up being the pretty dynamic film that it is and then garner enough attention and support to win an Oscar. Like, on paper, no chance. Whereas he wasn't led by ego in making films or choosing films. He's just made what he wants to make, does it well, let the work speak for itself, sometimes fails, but just moves forward and keeps making stories and learning from that. And it would have been a really interesting film had Fincher directed it because you wonder if Fincher would have recognised him and Steve Jobs and then intentionally or unintentionally amplified the asshole factor in that character. Yeah, well, do you think he did that in the social network? Because you could argue that old mate robot automaton who created Facebook has a pretty healthy ego and, you know, that certainly shines through. So, yeah, maybe fuckwit recognises fuckwit or, like, insanely talented dickhead recognises insanely talented dickhead. Or maybe not, because even though this expression on the spectrum is often misused unfairly, with awareness of mental health and personality traits in the last 10 years as a society, and I know this as a father because it becomes apparent when you have kids, that a lot more kids these days are diagnosed on the spectrum in relation to autism. And they call it a spectrum to make a point that there's not like, it's not binary to use that word before. It's like you can have a a mild, display a mild version of autism through to a more severe version. But that now that we know more about what autism is and Asperger's, people are now retrospectively understanding complicated celebrities, both in science, arts or whatever. And it explains like, why was that person incredibly unempathetic? Why was that person incredibly insensitive to those she or he worked with? And it has been speculated that Steve Jobs and Mark Zuckerberg had have a version of being on the spectrum. And what comes with being on the spectrum is actually incredible intelligence, but a lack of social awareness, a lack of EQ. So you wonder if Fincher did direct it, would he have the empathy or EQ if he displays similar characteristics to see that in his character? Yeah. I mean, the other thing, is, and this is not letting them off the hook, but Steve Jobs or to, in another way, Fincher or James Cameron or Stanley Kubrick, or they're all making movies or releasing products that there's a huge amount of pressure on them to make them a success. And I don't know, maybe that pressure then just manifests itself as being jerks to people. But then, you know, like you say, there's plenty of people who have those jobs or do those jobs and aren't jerks. So who knows? Look, one day I hope to be yelled at by David Fincher. That would be a career highlight for me. (laughs) But it also makes you wonder if people like, say, Terrence Malick, for example, who seem more introverted, is that perhaps one of the reasons why they, well, up until about 10 years ago, didn't make as many films because they didn't have the tenacity or the resilience or or the arrogance maybe to maintain surviving in that system of Hollywood. Totally. I mean, the other interesting thing is I suppose we should point out that it's always blokes, isn't it, who are the huge uh, pricks. You never- totally. You're right. You're right. You're 100% right. You never hear the stories of like um, oh, when, when Nikki Caro was directing McFarland USA, God damn it, she just fucking didn't stop yelling at people. Yeah, you're right, you know, you're right, 100%. So it's like, and it's always men, I guess, you make the excuses for as well, isn't it? Like, well, they were, a, you know, it's that classic thing, oh, women would just be difficult or whatever, but men, uh, what do you call it? Geniuses but troubled or something like that, you know? Yeah, it's so funny how if you look at, say, I think it was the 2009 or 2010 Oscars, if you compare Catherine Bigelow and James Cameron, who ironically were actually married to each other at one stage or together for many years, One has a reputation of being incredibly arrogant and insensitive to those he works for and everyone is collateral damage. The other one is known as being incredibly collaborative, reasonable, professional, polite. And you do wonder whether if Catherine Bigelow acted in the way that James Cameron has in the past, whether she would have been given a a hall pass like he's been given. Yeah. Even though her films have also been not as financially successful, but many of them have been very financially and critically successful. 
Yeah, totally. She's a phenomenal filmmaker. So what's the answer here? Do uh, do these men need to be less pricks or women? Step up. Fire some people in really embarrassing ways. Yell on set. Throw things. Get amongst it. I mean, also, too, I assume as well, because there are less female directors employed, they may be less likely to rock the boat, so to speak, as oh, totally. the male directors for fear of upsetting the opportunity that they have, which is so rare. Whereas totally. if they... If there was a greater proportion of female directors, they might feel more emboldened to be outspoken, and often they'd be outspoken in a positive, healthy, productive way, and I guess potentially it would be just the same thing as male directors, perhaps doing it in a arrogant, unreasonable way. But it does feel, as you say, as an overall comment, the blokes are jerks. <laughs> That's right. So let's jump to our combined review, uh, noting similarities, coincidence or ripoff. So- what did you see in common between these two films? I still get scenes confused in my head, as we've noted in various, talking about various bits. Like, if even just switching the actors, like, if you were like, oh, there was a scene in Jobs where Ashton Kutcher was backstage at the next launch, standing in a hallway amongst stack chairs, and Matthew Modine came and talked to him, I'd be like, oh, I remember that scene. But in fact, that was from Steve Jobs with Jeff Daniels. So it's actually real hard for me to go, like, oh, this is what the same is or different because it's all mixed together in my head. Like it's almost like if someone just made one more Steve Jobs movie and there probably is one more somewhere, you could cut them together into a kind of like I'm not there, Bob Dylan. You remember that movie, right? Yeah, with Kate Blanchard and Heath Ledger as well. Yeah, yeah, you know, some sort of uh, that fanciness. So I don't know. I guess what I'm saying is I'm confused in my brain. You tell me. I agree entirely with you, yet neither of us have an excuse because these films are quite different. Like, let's just start with the aesthetics. One set in the 60s and 70s and 80s with colour and music and various outdoor locations and he's considerably younger and the actor playing him, Ashton Kutcher, looks more like him. Juxtaposed with the Danny Boyle version with Michael Fassbender where he's wearing you know, white T-shirts and black pants, and it's a very muted film. It's colour palette. It all happens indoors. He's always surrounded by either his daughter, Lisa, his... I'm not sure if it was his wife, but um, his ex-girlfriend, and also Kate Winslet's character, playing Joanna Hoffman. So, we actually don't have many reasons to confuse them, but... It's still a lot of boardroom scenes, you know? Yeah, that's true, yeah. Or like business talk. Yeah. I mean, the scenes which involve the real-life people are Mike Merkler, I think it is, and John Scully, and they're played in various versions by, who is it, Dermot Mulready, is it? Mulroney. 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 Sorry, Mulroney. Jeff Daniels. I get confused as to where J.K. Simmons appears because, to be honest, he can play characters in terms of his acting choices. They could appear in either film. Because the dialogue is more naturalistic. It's grounded in jobs with Ashton Kutcher. The dialogue, surprise, surprise, from Aaron Dork- uh, Dorkin. <laughs> <laughs> Dorkin. Well, I guess it'd be- That's what he's called from now on. Well, I guess he's Aaron Dorkin when it comes to doing a film based on a Silicon Valley entrepreneur. He probably grew up being called Alan Dorkin his whole life. He probably did. <laughs> I'm actually surprised I actually haven't heard that used more online. But Aaron Dorkin. I guess doing all the serious years of drug abuse, which he's admitted to and stuff, is less conventionally dorky for a screenwriter. So, Oh, wow. Okay. I did not know that. I take it all back. He's talked about it in the press and stuff in the past. More like Aaron Cool Cool, cool Orkin. <laughs> doing drugs is not cool. Doing drugs will not make you Aaron Sorkin. Drugs are bad. Or will it? Get out there. Put the needle in your arm. Be Aaron Sorkin. Be somebody. This podcast does not endorse any behaviour, though. <laughs> It was probably cocaine and alcohol, though, right? Probably not smack. Yeah, I, th- I think it was those latter two that he's spoken about in terms of his addictions. Right. But that was a long time ago. So, Aaron Sorkin, his dialogue is very stylized. It's very theatrical. And there are other reasons why, in my head, I should distinguish these films. But like you, I confuse them. Maybe it's the plot beats that we confuse. Because you're entirely right. Like, they are very different movies, completely different executions. I mean, even their approach to them. Like, I like that Danny Boyle has cast someone to play Steve Jobs who really doesn't resemble Steve Jobs at all. So they're not going for a kind of verisimilitude in that way, are they? Yeah, that's one thing which we haven't touched on at all, and it is the elephant in the room. Michael Fassbender does not resemble physically Steve Jobs in any way at all. Like, 
if you go through the traits, his hair color, his face shape, his skin tone, his body shape. In fact, I don't even think he nails the cadence or the accent. And I assume that's because Danny Boyle doesn't want to focus on that. He wants to focus on the personality behind the accent. What do you think? Yeah, totally. I mean, you know, the Oscars, for instance, have a real habit of rewarding actors with Oscars for performances where they look just like the character and sound just like the character. And and I think, you know, there's cases where that's really good. You know, Jamie Foxx winning for Ray. I mean, that shit's uncanny. But other times I think, why are you trying so hard? Like, I don't really care that much about them being the splitting image of this person. I guess if I wanted that, I'd watch a, I'd just watch a doco. I really like that, like you said before about what Andy Hertzfeld said or the way Aaron Dorkin writes his dialogue or the way they've cast Fassbender. I think that makes for a more interesting movie or a differently interesting movie. Like they did the one, like Jobs is the one where the actor resembles the guy and he tries really hard to do his mannerisms. And they set all of the scenes probably where they were set. So I'm glad they didn't just do Jobs again with a more high profile cast and director and so on. Yeah, agreed 100%. It's clearly saying, look, we can't do the same, so we won't try to. Because if you try to, you risk failing. So you essentially lean in the opposite direction. Exactly. Now tell me, which film has aged better? They're both pretty recent films, but if you were to choose one over the other, which one has aged better in the last few years? I mean, if I was going to re-watch one, I'd probably re-watch Steve Jobs. I enjoy Jobs a lot, like I said, but I think Steve Jobs has more interesting elements and choices to it. And often if I'm going to re-watch a movie, unless I'm just drunk at night, I'm looking for something that you're watching because you're interested in the the decisions that were made that made that thing unique or different. So I like Jobs, but I don't think I'll watch it again. I probably liked it as much as Steve Jobs, but I'm sure I'll watch Steve Jobs a bunch more times over the years. So I guess Steve Jobs has aged better in that it's just the more interesting movie. I think. Yeah, I agree. I feel with Steve Jobs, you can drop into it to any one of those three scenes, essentially, strung together, main, you know, are the entire film, and just watch the patter patter dialogue and be entertained and then turn it off. Yeah, I mean, Sorkin's dialogue is always so great, isn't it? I'm sure when we get to the quotes section of this podcast, I know which film will probably have more memorable lines. Let's jump to plot holes and missed opportunities. What could the filmmakers have done better with this high concept of a bio about Steve Jobs, starting with Ashton Kutcher's film? I don't know enough about Jobs, I suppose, to be like, well, they got this wrong or that wrong. So I'm certainly not the plot hole guy or the, what do you call it, like the historical inconsistencies or something. I don't know. Could Jobs have been, I don't know. What do you think? This is interesting. What could it have done better? What could either of them done better? I think Steve Jobs was incredibly courageous, the Danny Boyle version, in that it did what Andy Hertzfield said, which was none of it was true and everything happened. It basically was a great example of doing a biopic where you don't constrain yourself to when and how things actually unfolded all of the time. You just try and capture the figurative truth of that character. And I just thought did a great job where it's pretty hard to tell a bio about someone's life when perhaps they're not as interesting as the device they created, potentially. And in this case, I thought Steve Jobs did a great job. I am surprised that Danny Boyle didn't actually infuse it with his the stylistic visual flourishes he had in 127 Hours to try and make the film less play-like, so to speak. But that, to me, just speaks to his confidence and trust as an experienced director where he thought, you know what, the dialogue is great. Let the actors do their thing and it'll be entertaining. No need to try and pull out any tricky David Fincher-style camera moves where you push the camera through the handle of a coffee mug like Fincher did in Panic Room. Just capture these guys and the spirit of their adventure, focus on the rhythm of the conversation in the edit, and the film will rise above. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's interesting how like, people think of like Danny Boyle having certain stylistic ticks or flourishes that he does in many or all of his movies, but he kind of doesn't. I mean, he, he does have certain things that he repeats, but if you watch Sunshine and 
if you watched 127 hours and if you watched Trainspotting 2, you wouldn't necessarily know they were from the same filmmaker. And I think that's phenomenal from him. He's got such range. So, yeah, like, would it have been cool if there was more scenes set in front of giant projections of things in Steve Jobs? Yeah, maybe visually it would have looked cool. Would it have been cool if there was more pulsating underworld score? Yeah, maybe, but probably not. So, I don't know. I'm glad he was more restrained on this. I thought it was interesting. It's a thing about a lot of these directors that people praise them for having this iconic style. And in The Social Network, Fincher is also dealing with the same dialogue of Aaron Sorkin. And so that's a nice comparison film in terms of how one director handled similar material about a similar Silicon Valley tycoon. And Fincher still indulges in Fincher flourishes. And to be clear, we both love Fincher and Danny Boyle. In fact, if I think about it, they're probably my two favourite directors. And Fincher has a scene set on the water during a – boat race, a, um, you know, those races, like a regatta. And it's sort of set to this iconic music. And he uses that kind of tilt-shift cinematography, which makes the rowers look like miniatures. Where you- yeah, it's very popular with apps at the time. And thank God it's disappeared. Yeah, it was basically like a way of making it look like you're looking at a mini world, like you're looking at a train set, for example. You sort of see the same sort of aesthetic used in the Ant-Man films to try and make Ant-Man look like the size of an ant, where you kind of blur out the background. And so he still tries to find opportunities to have some visual fun. But Boyle has just trusted himself. The one surprising thing for me, if I was to try and search desperately for any common characteristic of Danny Boyle's films, which isn't always there, but it'd probably be score, where he uses music to move the story further forward and to complement what's happening on screen. Like he loves a good score using contemporary songs. And if he doesn't have access to those because they're not suitable, like in Sunshine, he casts a kick-ass composer that creates a really incredible score. In this film, I can't even recall there being music. And that was not a bad thing, but I can't think of music in any way being used in a montage sequence or to draw attention to itself. Can you? No, I definitely can't. It definitely has, you know, a, a score, but certainly not. Um, I mean, according to IMDb, you know, the times are changing is in it. Joni Mitchell songs in it. There's a bunch of Bob Dylan songs, but yeah, it's certainly not like dropping some sort of iconic track, like you know, um, Train Spotting soundtrack, the sort of soundtrack that every single person owned in the '90s. Like literally, no one didn't own that soundtrack on CD. That soundtrack and the Pulp Fiction poster and also the train spotting poster as well. The Go soundtrack, that was popular. Everyone everyone had that one. Good soundtrack. Remember that movie? Yeah, Go. love the Go. Classic. All right, Classic. let's jump to trivia because we've been banging on. So let's go behind the scenes with some making of trivia about these twin movies. So little did you know, did you know that in Ashton Kutcher's Jobs that to prepare for his role, Kutcher followed a fruitarian diet? similar to Jobs' reported diet. But that's the same diet that, well, Steve Jobs was on because of pancreatitis. And apparently Ashton Kutcher, days before shooting, was hospitalised with pancreatitis too. Okay, well, well, you can certainly tell in his performance. (laughs) Good work. I never understand why actors bother with that shit personally. But, you know, if it was part of Kutcher's process, I'm steepling my fingers as I say this (laughs) very seriously. If getting pancreatitis from eating just... Being a fruitarian was important to him. Well, you can see it in every frame of that film. <laughs> uh, we mentioned binary before. Did you know that when Steve Jobs take a, takes a calligraphy class in Ashton Kutcher's films, he's drawing ones and zeros, the basis for binary code? I did. What a detail. <laughs> did you know that Ashton Kutcher was born in 1978, one year after the Apple II was created? I mean, that's not even trivia. That's just that's just a fact. Did you know Michael Fassbender was born five years before Steve Jobs' first, like, I don't know, does that matter? <laughs> Seems weird. Agreed. Where do you get this information from? Okay. The interwebs. Ah, fucking internet. All right. Let's jump to trivia for Steve Jobs. Did you know that the three sequences in the film were filmed on 16mm, 35mm and digital to illustrate the advancement of Apple's tech 
across the 16 years depicted in Jobs' life. No, but now that's the shit, mate. That's the good trivia I'm, I'm after. That's really interesting. Classic Danny Boyle. Totally. And also, too, perhaps you don't notice it consciously, particularly if you're not a filmmaker, but you might notice subconsciously as you're watching the film. Yeah. That feels like a definite Danny Boyle flourish, though much less conspicuous than some of his other previous traits. But uh, that's a cool fact. I like that one. Did you know that the three-act film was shot in sequence? And actors spent four weeks on each act, rehearsing for two weeks and then filming for two weeks. Wait, so they'd rehearse for two weeks, shoot for two weeks, break for two weeks to rehearse, shoot for two weeks? I don't think they broke for two weeks. So they probably shot the film over about six weeks. Two week rehearsal, two week shoot, two week rehearsal, two week shoot. Yeah, but like, what are the, are all the grips and boom swingers and just standing around watching the rehearsals? Yeah, probably. That's an easy paycheck for those guys for that fortnight. Totally. But they're shooting the whole film in six weeks. It's still an incredibly fast shoot. Oh, totally. Did you know that when they started doing Act 3, Michael Fassbender didn't even have his script of the rehearsals as he'd memorised all 180 pages? Yeah, that's his job. That's pretty impressive. I don't know. When I was 11 years old, I did school plays where I memorised a lot of lines, all right? Let's not blow smoke up Fassbender's ass just for knowing his lines, being off book, all right? Good Did you know that Fincher was originally, originally attached, but he dropped after he demanded a $10 million salary and full creative control? Yeah, that doesn't seem surprising. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's right. Did you know that Aaron Sorkin never met Steve Jobs in person? But he'd spoken to him- I'd on, never met? No, but he had spoken to him on okay. the phone three times. While writing this or just he just called him up one day when he was doing something else? I don't have the information that you request. No, uh, okay. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> Did you know it's actually the third film based on Steve Jobs' life? So you could actually edit a film like you talk about to be like that Bob Dylan film because the first one is The Pirates of Silicon Valley from 1999. Oh, have I seen that? And this is the one that stars that guy from ER, Noah Wiley. I have seen that. Yeah. Oh, I mean, I remember nothing about that movie, but I have seen it. Where did I see it? Let's talk about that for a second. No, I don't know. I can't remember anything about, about this movie. Except someone plays Bill Gates, Anthony Michael Hall. That's it. Yeah, I remember this movie. All right. I'm going to cut together the I'm not there of Steve Jobs. Look for it on fanedits.com. All right, excellent. Coming soon. Let's jump to casting woulda, shouldas. So we've already teased out some of the uh, coulda, woulda, shouldas. Let's start with Jobs. I couldn't find any pearls as to who may have been cast before, but that's probably because this film was a relatively low-budget film and so there wouldn't have been any big names in the mix. But let's go to casting woulda shouldas for uh, Steve Jobs. So did you know that Dakota Fanning was a possibility to play Lisa, his daughter? In Steve Jobs? Yep. I presume as the oldest version of the yeah exactly the daughter yeah and Jessica okay. Chastain was down as Joanna Hoffman eventually played by Kate Winslet right well she might have done a consistent accent potentially potentially this will blow your mind Sorkin originally wanted Tom Cruise to play Steve Jobs oh that would have been awesome I would have watched the heck out of that do you think that would have been a better <laughs> film or worse film no look I'm a huge Tom Cruise fan. Team TC, 100%. But, yeah, no, I think I like that Fassbender doesn't resemble Jobs at all, but I think if you put someone in sort of so iconic as Tom Cruise, it would have felt at odds or something. Like, yeah, if you're going to do that, just cast Will Smith or something. Like, go way out there. <laughs> that is way out. And, honestly, Natalie Portman was also in talks as well. I assume she would have played Joanna Hoffman as well. Again, played by Kate Winslow. Yeah, I think I recall hearing that, reading that one in the trades at the time. All right, let's jump to Spot the Aussie. Were there any Aussies in Jobs or Steve Jobs? Mm. I don't think so. Yes. Which one? No, there's an Aussie in Steve Jobs. Oh, of course. Sarah Snook. Sarah Snook. So Aussies would have seen Sarah Snook in Steve Jobs like Gabe and I and thought, oh, fantastic, it's our gal, as we've been huge fans of her for years. But most of the world didn't really pay attention to her until she popped up on the HBO series Succession, playing one of the heirs to the fortune. But she's good in Steve Jobs, isn't she? Like, she's really smug and funny and incredibly confident. Yeah, yeah, she's great. May as well just quickly use this opportunity to plug the movie Predestination that she's in. Good film. 
Go watch that. Great low-budget Aussie sci-fi by the Spiery Brothers. If you haven't seen Predestination, everyone is on top of their game. Writers, directors, producers, editors, cinematographer, cast. Really good film. All right, let's jump to Big Trouble in Little Production. We pretty much covered most of it, but we had Fincher in the hot seat for Steve Jobs and pulled out. The only other interesting fact to add here is that the first film didn't have the official endorsement of Apple and Steve Jobs, that film didn't as much either, but did have Steve Wozniak on board as a consultant, which is pretty crucial. And it was based on Walter Isaacson's New York best-selling book, which is considered to be, I guess, the authoritative, most truthful account of Steve Jobs' life. All right, let's jump to the box office. Which movie was the box office champ? Have a guess, Gabe. I would just guess Steve Jobs, the Danny Boyle film, because it probably got a much wider release. So let's start with Jobs had a budget of 12 mil, made 16 million domestically in the US, plus 25 international for 42 million. That really surprised me. So it made 42 million off a budget of 12, which is much more money in terms of profit than I expected. Yeah, I assumed it was a straight to video movie that even hearing about hearing its budget is much higher than I thought. I presumed it probably had, you know, a five or six million dollar budget and yeah, made some money selling to cable or something. But wow, good on the jobs team. So this will blow your mind. Steve Jobs okay. had a budget of thirty million, almost three times as much, made only seventeen domestically, sixteen internationally, for a total of thirty four worldwide. Wow. The producers of Jobs 2013, happy. The producers of Steve Jobs, not happy. That is quite amazing. I was really surprised by that. Yeah, I was way off. Yeah. I was way off. We both were. We both were. Fuck. Incredible. Okay, let's then jump to Rotten Tomatoes. So, let's start with Jobs. Which one do you think resonated with the critics the most? I think the critics would have probably been... I'm not saying that their critics don't do a phenomenal job of being impartial, arbiters of taste, able to put aside any preconceived notions of what a film might be to deliver an even-handed review. But I reckon they're probably just unfairly mean to old mate Ashton. And mean they were. 28% on the (laughs) tomato meter, which is a really bad score. 28%. This film does not deserve 28%. They came to the film with the same prejudice that you and I had, but I feel they were too harsh. This it kills me when you say that, Ben. I've written a movie with a 28% of my score, but right in my heart. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, mate. <laughs> it's as good as Jobs. <laughs> and Steve Jobs actually has an 86% score on the tomato meter. Yeah, totally unsurprising, I think. How about audiences? I'd say evens. Jobs, 40%. Steve Jobs, 73%. That doesn't surprise uh, me. I think people are unfairly hard on Kucha's jobs. It's not, guys, it's not that bad. It's pleasant. It's perfectly pleasant. Exactly. Exactly. All right. Let's go to the awards. Here we go. Let's do it. We've been yakking all day. Now let's get into the, the awards. So, best title, <laughs> Jobs or Steve Jobs? I like Steve Jobs because if I saw a movie advertised as Jobs, I'd be like, "What? What is it about Jobs? Is it about just? Is it about like menial work, white collar work, blue collar? What sort of Jobs are we talking is about? It porno? Steve Jobs? Yeah, is it, it could be. You know, I agree. All right, so Steve Jobs gets it. Best poster. I don't know what are them. Well, Jobs Ashton Kutcher's film has this kind of psychedelic color poster, which basically recreates the iconic photograph of Steve Jobs that appears on Walter Isaacson's biography on the dust jacket of him staring into the reader's eyes holding his chin and overlays it with kind of the colour palette that defined the Apple logo. Multiple colours. I think this post is probably saying, look at Ashton Kutcher's transformation. Forget Kelso from that 70s show. Now he is truly inhabiting the role of a lifetime job. Exactly. The Steve Jobs poster is all white with a tiny black and white side profile image of Michael Fassbender in the right bottom corner, and then just has Steve Jobs written in lowercase black font with the names of the actors. It's very minimalist. All right, I'm going for Jobs just because Ashton Kutcher's transformative performance thrills me. Done. I agree. So Jobs wins Best Poster. Okay, the Bill Fleck Big Break Award, named after Billy Bob Thornton and Ben Affleck, 
Who jumped from the indie world and got their big break in these twin movies, starting with Jobs? Well, is Jobs the sort of movie that is really a launching pad for anybody? It's almost the opposite, isn't it? It's almost like the actors de- slumming de- it yeah, in an indie film. Well, I, look, I'm sure Kevin Dunn and John Gertz and, and Ron Eldard and Leslie Ann Warren were all just happy to turn up for a couple of days on set and probably bank reasonably good paychecks. So, you know, good for them. Yeah, I'd say if we spun it round, you might say it was a good opportunity for someone like Dermot Mulroney or Matthew Modine to reappear in a film with a more interesting role than perhaps a side role they'd have in a bigger film. Maybe, though these are still side roles for these guys. Totally. And look, I don't want to hear any of this Mulroney knocking, all right? Mulroney rules, all right? I like Mulroney. I'm just saying that, like Modine, his career has had ups and downs and uh, he hasn't yeah. been given his dues as I think, like you would say, he deserves. Yeah, fair. Okay. Pour one out for Mulroney. But Steve Jobs is probably easier. For me, it's Sarah Snook. Big break from okay. indie movies to a pretty high-profile Hollywood film. Yep, fair. Done. Let's give it to Snook. Give it to the Oscar. All right. The Before They Were Famous Award or Blink and You'll Miss Them. Who appeared in this film that's gone on to bigger things since? Starting with Jobs. Did anyone? No. <laughs> they were, again, it was the reverse. They're all recognisable faces who kind of decide to appear in something smaller, really. I mean, Josh Gad, maybe, but I think he was- No, he's like a nine-time Tony Award. Isn't he a big deal on Broadway? I think he is. Never love him. Steve Jobs? Well, we mentioned Sarah Snook. Anyone else? No, just give them all to Snook. Actually, I'd give it to Catherine Waterson. She had been in, she had been in Inherent Vice before this? Yeah, Not. she was in Inherent Vice the year before. That was probably her big break. Then this film, and then Alien Covenant afterwards. Oh, but well, she had that terrible haircut. Yeah, yeah. Ugh. I'm giving it to Ugh. Sarah Snook. Okay, great. The Tommy Lee Jones Show Stealer Award. Who stole the show despite being in a small or poorly written role, starting with Jobs? Ron Elder. Ron Elder. Who did he play? He plays a character named Rod Holt, who's like, they need just the best dang, best dang solderer of, of motherboards or some computer shit. I don't know. And so- Ashton Kutcher brings in the big guns and Ron Eldard rolls up on his motorbike and he's like, I want I want ten thousand dollars a week and I want I want to be able to I don't know, he has the list of demands and he's just a cool guy, cool computer guy, and he's Ron Eldard. All right, I'll agree with that. <laughs> Good. Ron gets it. Ron Eldard. I love All right. love Ron Eldard. The Dustin Diamond Award. Who didn't make the most of their opportunities after appearing in this film? Catherine Waterson? <laughs> well, she was in Alien Covenant, so I think she yeah, okay. did in that window of time kick on. Any other takers at all? I was surprised that uh, – who's that guy that played Andy Hertzfield? I'm always surprised oh, he hasn't kicked on more. Dude, Michael Stolberg, he's in every movie. What are you talking about? He's so great. Well, he needs to have bigger roles because I think he's really good. Have you – A Serious Man, that Coen Brothers film, he's phenomenal in that. I'm not- he was in Call Me By Your Name, The Shape of Water, Miss Sloan. Okay, you know who didn't kick on and should have? Oh. Perla. Haney Jardine, who plays the older of the leases. Okay, that's fair. And I'll give you one for jobs. Which one? The bloke who wrote it, Matt Whiteley. Only credit. Never done anything else. Oh, okay. Actually, he wins. I think because I think he did a great job and have only one credit. And that film, I I think he's done a great job. You're right. Actually, the other person though, Joshua Michael Stern, the director. I was looking at his filmography I'm surprised he hasn't gone on to bigger things. He did a TV show called Graves afterwards, between 16 and 17, and then nothing else. There's a film called Closer to Fine that's been announced with no information. But I thought he did a yep. great job. I think he was attached to some De Niro, Sheila Booth movie, but I don't know if that's happening or not. But I think, yeah, let's give it to Matt Whiteley. Okay, the writer of jobs. Okay. Matt Whiteley. The winner winner chicken dinner award. Who came out on top and was it their career high? Interesting. Let's start with Jobs. So who came out on top on Jobs? Who was like, including actors, writers, director, etc. Who do you think stole the show and won the movie? I think Kutcher came out on top. And even if people might say otherwise, this is probably his best performance in a, in a movie. It's certainly his best performance since The Butterfly Effect. Yeah, I agree. I think Ashton Kutcher sort of won the movie. I think 
I'm surprised he wasn't a producer. I just assumed he'd be an executive producer on this film, but he wasn't. But I thought he was fantastic. So for me, I'm giving it to him. Is it a career high for him? I mean, I guess as a drama credit, I'd say it's one of his best drama credits. You know, he's generally been defined by his roles in reality TV and comedies. So I guess I'd say for something on his CV that helps him with his drama chops, I'd say it's a career high. How about you? I would agree with that, yes. How about Steve Jobs? Who came out on top? I don't know. I think this is a just a reasonable entry for everyone involved. I mean, I'm saying Catherine Watterson. I thought she was really good, and I think it's one of her best roles. Uh, okay, give it to her then. I don't have a strong opinion either way on that. Playing Jobs' ex-girlfriend, Chris Ann Brennan, and the mother of their daughter, Lisa. Okay, jumping to the best dialogue ward. Ah, okay. There'll be a few for Steve Jobs, but let's start with Jobs, Ashton Kutcher's movie. Any quotes jump out at you as being memorable? I mean, certainly none that you immediately remember. Like, I'd have to look them up. I'd have to go online and be like, oh, yeah, that was that was not bad. But, I mean, Jesus, a fancy writing a movie and then having to have your movie compared to a movie wrote by Aaron Sorkin. You're never going to come out on top of that, are you? No, no, it is hard. There was one line I found quite funny in Ashton Kutcher's film. It's when uh, Kutcher says, so this is the Macintosh team. And his actor, a character called Bill Atkinson, he responds, um... Jesus. And Jobs responds, no, it's just Steve. It's interesting because both movies have that idea of him being like deifying him because in Steve Jobs, there's that line where Andy Hersfeld says, you know, we're not a pit crew at Daytona. This can't be fixed in seconds. And Jobs is like, you didn't have seconds. You had three weeks. The universe was created in a third of that time. And Andy says, well, someday you'll have to tell us how you did it. It's a great line. I love that line. Yeah, it's really good. Um, Yeah. I guess, yeah, they both speak to this sort of deification, but fuck, it's a corker, that one. So even just you bring up Jobs as one good quote, well, Steve Jobs has it beat. Yeah, that's great. Another line I like, uh, let's jump to Steve Jobs. There's a line where he says, um, I don't want people to dislike me. I'm indifferent to whether they dislike me. That's just a great line that sums up his personality. Like, he doesn't even care how he's considered by people. And that just captures, I think everything about his character as represented in that biography and as we know. It's a bit like that idea of whether he was on the spectrum or not in terms of his lack of awareness of the opinions of others and then potentially his arrogance as to whether he was aware or not, he didn't care. Yeah, you're right, that indifference. I mean, doesn't John Scully at one point say, why do people like you who are adopted feel like they were rejected instead of selected? And maybe he's trying to point, Sorkin's trying to point back to even that sort of earliest moment as a, as something that created him. Yeah, yeah. It's, I also like that part when he um, says, doesn't he say, I don't understand several times? He's kind of repeating this phrase. No, something like, I don't understand what you're telling me or why are you telling me that? There's this recurring line he uses, which is showing that he simply doesn't get something, but he says what you and I wouldn't say. Like, you are saying words, and I don't understand what those words are. Try again. Yeah, totally. And then they've got all the classics that speak to his those classic jobbers and speak to his genius. They, are, they won't know what they're looking at or why they like it, but they'll know they want it. Yeah. I mean, I go through this entire script and every second line's a pearler. So Join us while we now read out the entirety of the <laughs> Steve Jobs script. I will play Kate Winslet's part. <laughs> I'll play Hello. Andy Hertzfield. Just relax. Why? I do not know. No. Whatever fucking <laughs> accent she was doing. It did seem to vary. I think it was meant to be Polish, wasn't it? Yes, but she became increasingly more and less Polish. I know. I know. It's funny. There are some actors we give a pass to as being great actors, and she's one of them, but her accent fluctuates a lot in that film. But she's done hard accents in other movies. I know. She's, I know. she's done the Australian accent, which I tell you, that's a fucking tough one. I know. And I think from memory she did it all right. But, yeah, here. Hui. She's one of the few actors in the world to nail an Australian accent, which says a lot. But I guess none of this compares to the accent evolution of Scarlett Johansson, where I think in the first, I think it's Iron Man 2 when she first appears as Black Widow, she has a distinctly Russian accent. And if you watch one of those honest movie trailers, they illustrate this. And then I think by the film after that, the next film, they just basically go, you know what, let's just give her an American accent. And then from then on, it's just an American accent. And she's referred to as a Rush, an ex-Russian agent, 
but there is no hint to her accent at any point after that. It's really odd. So if you, watch, if you go back and watch Iron Man 2, it stands out quite a lot. But I have to go back and watch Iron Man Yeah, 2. so, yeah, it comes with the pain. All right, let's jump to the Nicolas Cage Chewing the Scenery Award. Jobs versus Steve Jobs. Our contenders are... That you're asking who are the contenders for scenery. Well, Ron Eldard chews some scenery, so he's back on the list. Okay. And then I guess in Jobs, who chews some scenery in Jobs? Is Fassbender chewing scenery? Would you describe his central performance as a scenery chewer? You mean back in Steve Jobs? Yes. Fassbender, I do feel, is chewing a bit of scenery, to be honest. I'm not sure why, but his performance feels much more manufactured. Like, I actually find Seth Rogen incredibly naturalistic compared to... Fassbender's character. But that could also be the idea that he's meant to be more empathetic and warm and cuddly, and so you just gravitate more towards him. Yeah. Actually, you know what? Kate Winslet. I reckon with yeah. that accent, she's chewing the scenery. So For the reasons previously discussed. Yeah, exactly. And I think she probably even nails it over Ashton Kutcher in Jobs. So I'm giving it to Kate Winslet. Right. Give it to Kate. Done. The Taking a Paycheck Award, which speaks for itself. Jobs. Was anyone taking a paycheck or were they slumming it for for scale? I think James Woods was probably taking a yeah, paycheck. Yeah, I think so as well. You know, I like had him too. A whole bunch of jobs like we discussed. He's one of those movies where a lot of actors turn up for one or two scenes, which I love. Okay. Which How I, about like, in Steve the jobs, jobs? Anyone slumming it there? I don't think anyone turns up to a movie directed by Danny Boyle and written by Aaron Sorkin and, and slums it. No, okay? I agree. No one slums it on that. I think they're all very happy to be there and they do it for- Bring your motherfucking A game. Exactly. All right. Woodsy gets it for jobs. All right. The Stephen Tobolowsky Award, named after the actor playing Ned Ryerson from Groundhog Day, who triggered the, hey, it's that guy, when he or she appeared on screen, starting with the Jobs movie. There's quite a few in this. Lucas Haas. Oh, check it out. It's the kid from Witness. <laughs> Big ears. Yep, totally. I had also Ron Eldard, Dermot yes. Moroni. Yes. Brett Gilman. He played an act. He, he's a guy from Fleabag who plays the brother-in-law. Oh, okay. So I had him down. Anyone else? Oh, I mean, the cast of Jobs is a lot of... Oh, Matthew Modine. I wonder what happened to him since Full Metal Jacket. I mean, he was doing a lot of things, don't get me wrong, but yeah, there he is. Modine. So who's Modine up against? I'd say in Steve Jobs, I'd say John Ortiz, who plays a oh, journalist. I love that guy. Yep. He's probably the only yep. guy who sort of fell into this category for me. Everyone else was pretty famous already. Maybe Michael Stuhlbarg, Stuhlberg, who played Andy Hertzfield. Yeah, I'd consider giving it to Stuhlbarg. All right. But, um, Stooley gets it. Stooley. All right. The Delroy Lindo Award for great actors who aren't cast often enough. So I'm going to put down in Jobs, Lucas Hass, and in Steve Jobs, I'm going to put down as my nominee, Michael Stuhlbarg. How about you? I agree, 100%. Both those two guys. Who nails it? Look, as someone sympathetic to the plight of people with big sticking out ears, I think Lucas Hash should be cast in more stuff. Wasn't he a founding member of the Pussy Posse? Leonardo DiCaprio's like um, gang with Tobey Maguire. Oh, well, yeah. if he was a founder and award winner for the Pussy Posse, then surely he deserves this award as well. So, Give it to him. All right. He can stick that on his little hat, the Delroy Lindo Award. See if that gets him more pussy as part of the Pussy Posse. Okay, the Memphis Reigns Award, inspired by the absurdly named character played by Nick Cage from Gone in 60 Seconds. Who steals the cake for the most ludicrous name? <laughs> this is a bit harsh because being biopics, we'd be criticising the real <laughs> name of real people. Yeah, what type of a stupid foreign-sounding name is Wozniak? Am I right? Vote Brexit. Uh, I think we call this one a dead yeah, rubber because <laughs> yeah, totally. it's, a, it's a biopic. All right, yep. the yep. Memento Award, named for moments you completely forgot about until you rewatch these movies. Well, I think we both saw Jobs for the first time, so we have to rule that one out. But how about Steve Jobs? I mean, there's lots of little pieces of dialogue where you just constantly like, oh, that's great, that's great. Oh, oh, so great, so great. So it's a lot of that, but it's not – I didn't think it was particularly visual. We were like, wow, I totally forgot they had this massive crane shot or, or something. So, yeah, it's a tough one, this one. Was there anything that stood out for you? No, just that line you mentioned before about when Andy Hertzfeld says, well, one day you'll tell us how you did it, basically referring to Jobs as a deity like Jesus or God. That was it, like those kind of lines, the ones where I went, oh, yeah, that's right, that's a great line. All right, let's jump to the Die Hard Award, named after the influence of Die Hard. Do these biopics inspire a biopicassance, a renaissance of biopics or anything like that? 
No, biopics are always going to get made because actors and producers and directors think that they're a good way to make win some awards. <laughs> I think you're right. All right, Gabe, it's come to that time of the podcast as we near the end. It's the Milking the Speed Cow Dry Award, named after the infamous sequel Speed 2, which took the high stakes of a runaway bus and relocated it to a sluggish cruise ship. So imagine this. So let's say there's an opportunity to make a sequel to Jobs or Steve Jobs. Okay. <laughs> They're both about the life of Apple founder Steve Jobs, who has since died. And yeah, okay. we somehow have to make a sequel. Hollywood said, all right, we need a sequel to Jobs. That guy's a big deal. So first of all, we have to make a sequel to one of these films, to his life. So which film do we make a sequel to and what's our pitch to make it? Okay, are we assuming that this sequel is taking place after he's dead? Do we have the Alien 3 problem? Like, are we doing, like, Steve Jobs' resurrection? Is that what we're dealing with here? Well, here's our options. We can end where either the Ashton Kutcher biopic Jobs ends, which is around the time of the iMac being released, or we could end where the Steve Jobs biopic starring Michael Fassbend ended, and that was around the time of the iPhone, wasn't it, or... Something like yeah, that. Yeah, somewhere in there. But neither of them have him on his deathbed carking it. No. All right, then. Our options are we either continue either film until Jobs passes away or we make it more like an Apple biopic, more about the company, not just Steve Jobs, and perhaps it's telling the story of Apple now under the tutelage, the leadership of their current CEO, Tim Cook. So, the- Yeah, that sounds horrendously boring. What about a third way, which is Steve Jobs is somehow cloned and wakes up in a future where his genius is needed to solve some sort of problem that is we have yet not figured out, but it takes the idea and pushes it into a sci-fi thing, not unlike Alien Resurrection. Oh, I like this. Okay, so let me talk about Alien Resurrection. That is the fourth film in the Alien franchise, much maligned, but I love it. So it does take the idea of saying, how do we try and bring back Ellen Ripley, played by Sigourney Weaver, who, spoilers, if you haven't seen a film set 25 years ago, Alien 3, she dies, but they clone her and bring her back. But the twist of the film in Alien Resurrection is that she comes back with her DNA being mutated and infused with alien DNA. So she kind of is incredibly empathetic to the aliens whilst being mainly human and also has some of their traits like semi-acidic blood. I've got it. Steve Jobs comes back and he's been resurrected in an iPhone. (laughs) You see, his DNA has somehow magically, sort of magical realism or something, been zapped into a little iPhone and he has to convince whomever owns it, maybe it's a plucky child, maybe it's like an old man, maybe it's some lady going through some sort of problem. Again, I, I don't know what the specific, but he's in the iPhone. Maybe Grant's wishes out of it. I don't know. But Steve Jobs is in a phone. Okay, let's go with that. He is in an iPhone. He is the AI. Is this going the way of Terminator, where essentially Steve Jobs is Skynet? And perhaps this is exactly why it could be called iJobs. <laughs> Okay, okay. Because he's in the phone. So Steve Jobs in a phone. Oh, hang on. Now we can go two ways. We can do a Jobs sequel, which essentially is in the spirit of a Terminator film where he is Skynet, but rather than being from the point of view of the Terminator or John Connor or Linda Hamilton's character, it can be from the point of view of Skynet, right? Okay, I like it. Or he's trapped in his own iPhone And it is the third film in the Tron films. So essentially, it's Jobs meets Tron. Oh, okay. So he has to somehow get out of the iPhone. And the irony is, is because Apple's products, their software and hardware, are defined by a closed ecosystem, that essentially it's like a prison breakout film. This is like the Sylvester Stallone film, Escape Plan, where you take the guy who's the guy that's designed the prisons that cannot be escaped from. And in those films, Stallone is placed inside one of those prisons. And so the person who has to escape is the person who designed a prison that cannot be escaped from. I love it. This is the same film with Steve Jobs in which he is trapped in an ecosystem and now has to basically learn his journey 
that maybe Steve Wozniak, his co-founder of Apple, was right and it should have been open source. So just along the way, he learns to have patience and empathy, and that's the heart of the film. The, the only way he could truly escape is when he allows himself to be humbled somehow. Exactly. So what he has to do, his journey in death or his new life as AI, is to try and redeem himself because when he was alive, he was characterised as someone who was incredibly arrogant and unempathetic. Huge prick. Big prick. Big prick. So in death slash new AI life, he has to basically cooperate, be respectful with the various people he meets inside this closed ecosystem if he's to get his way out. And then right. when he escapes his closed ecosystem, like in Tron 1 or Tron 2. Or Wreck-It Ralph. Or Wreck-It Ralph <laughs> to the real yeah. world, he will then have a chance of redemption, albeit not as flesh and blood, but in a open source new version of Apple, which will then ensure Apple is able to evolve beyond Tim Cook's more conservative leadership to perhaps compete with Google as open source. Nice. I like it. This movie's so dumb that we definitely want Kucha, not Fassbender, for it, though. All right. So, a casting in that case, in Tron or in these films, when you enter this new reality, Essentially, with time doesn't matter. You have an age as flesh and blood, so you can be whoever you want to be. So, in that case, is Ashton Kutcher the most ideal version of Steve Jobs? Well, I think he's probably the most ideal version for a movie with a premise that is, as we have described, an awesome premise. So, our pitch then to Hollywood is we're making a sequel to Jobs. It is Sylvester Stallone's escape plan meets Tron meets The Matrix, meets Ashton Kutcher's indie drama, Jobs. I like it. I have no idea why this movie hasn't been greenlit already. Perhaps because it doesn't have a title. And what's our title going to be? Didn't we decide it was I Jobs? Well, I Jobs is good, but I do tend to lean towards anything that's two jobs, too furious. Okay, that's good too. I like it. It could just be called I Jobs colon two jobs too furious if we just want to get all the titles in there i think the no-brainer here is it's got to be the naming convention of the tech industry it's got to be called jobs version 2.0 okay that's good and then we can make incremental updates to the movie as it goes and it could be 2.1 2.11 we could give them names like the apple operating systems it could be i jobs too fast too furious whatever the fuck that was canyonero and if we want to add, say, special features to the Blu-ray or the director's cut or do the uncut Deadpool version with cussing and coarse language, it can just be called Jobs Uncut or totally Jobs Version 3 Unlimited. Totally. And then at a later date, we could even remove features and just say, hey, too bad, guys. I know you like that headphone jack. Yeah, it doesn't exist anymore. I know you like that plot point. I know you liked James Woods returning, but he's trouble now. He's gone. He's not in the movie anymore. He's gone. That update erased James. So then it's just called I Job. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I Job. And then eventually just Itch. I Joe. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is how you make a sequel to the life of Steve Jobs and the Ashton Kutcher biopic Jobs. All right, Gabe, that brings us to the end of the show. Where can listeners find more of your work and musings this week? Just go to Twitter or something, I guess, at Gabe Dowrick. <sighs> and I'm at Ben Phelps on Twitter and Instagram and YouTube.com slash Ben Phelps. You can find all my podcasts, including Twin Movies, in the usual places like Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Thank you for listening, folks, and we hope you enjoyed the show. It's great for us to be back on the mics. So take care and stay tuned for another Twin Movies battle very soon. See you, Gabe. See you, Ben. Bye-bye.